Now, let me introduce, we have two speakers this month, which is really, really exciting. We have Audrey Bennett. Audrey G. Bennett is the director of the Design for Social Innovation and Sustainability Lab at Penny W. Stamp School of Art and Design and an inaugural university diversity and social transformations professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She uses, yeah, she uses the design of transformative images that, through interactive aesthetics, can permeate cultural boundaries and impact how we think and behave towards good social change. Wow, what an amazing description, and it's going to be great to hear her talk in a few seconds. Jennifer Vukun will be speaking secondly, and Jennifer A. Vukun is an Associate Professor of Graphic Design at Walsh University, Ohio, USA. Her research focuses on design and social innovations applied to sustainable food systems and food insecurity issues. Again, these are two amazing speakers and they've produced an amazing book that's now on the reading list for my course on the Masters for Food Policy. But without any more introduction, I warmly welcome um, both speakers to um, put on their cameras, unmute, and please everybody, when you're watching at home, give them a round of applause, jazz hands, etc. Welcome Audrey and Jennifer to present tonight's Food Thinkers. Thank you, Christian, for those amazing introductions. We're delighted to be presenting today. <clears throat> While attending a design research conference at the University of Michigan in 2018, my co-presenter, Jennifer Vokun, and I met in the hallway at Penny W. Stamp School of Art and Design. After brief introductions, we discovered that we both had an interest in food as graphic designers, and so began a research collaboration spanning several years that is manifested in the book that you see, from which our presentation is based. In this book, we introduced a problematizing, reflective approach to design inquiry that we call critical mapping that investigates how existing design outcomes, which we call do's, can be coupled to form a wicked solution to address a wicked problem. In our presentation, we will start by describing the steps involved in our critical mapping approach before discussing the current state of the wicked problem of food insecurity. We will then take you through our critical mapping process for visualizing the wicked solution to food insecurity. We will show some of the sustainable food design outcomes that we found and conclude with a brief discussion of next steps. We argue that to attain this essential understanding and um, food secure state where all people have access to healthy food daily should also entail compiling and analyzing the existing sustainable food dues. Only then can one see the current state of the food system and where there may be gaps for design innovation or appropriation. When we plot the existing design outcomes onto the Wicked Solution Grid, we call this process critical mapping as we can use the final visualization strategically to determine leverage points or places to intervene to shift that system further towards equity and justice. Critical mapping begins with a literature review of peer review sources to find existing design outcomes that address the wicked problem to plot onto the wicked solution grid. For instance, let's critically map the wicked solution to food insecurity. When we conducted a literature review of peer-reviewed sources, we found 73 top-down, bottom-up, sustainable food design outcomes that address different phases of the food system from agriculture to waste. When we map them to the Wicked Solution Grid as shown, we see clear gaps in the food system in need of both bottom-up and top-down innovation and appropriation to yield food security, equity, and justice. The current social context that warrants critical mapping is a complex system that comprises a wicked problem, a wicked solution, and leverage points. 
a wicked problem is a complex societal issue that exists within an evolving system of hyper-local, context-specific, cross-cultural and cross-disciplinary challenges. A wicked solution is a visualization of these design outcomes across a spectrum of top-down and bottom-up and widespread and localized innovation that address that wicked problem. Leverage points are places to intervene in the system that can shift it from its current state of a wicked problem towards a more sustainable future that is just and equitable. Leverage points are gleaned from the analysis of the wicked solution. Food security is a state where all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious, nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. The Food and Agriculture Organization's Food Insecurity Experience Scale strategically uses semiotic hues for danger and safety. It ranges in color from green, which means food secure, to green yellow, meaning mild food insecurity, to yellow orange, moderate food insecurity, to orange red, which means severe food insecurity. It is used to measure the state of food security among people individually and in households across the globe. For instance, the person depicted um, or symbolized under the orange area has insufficient money or resources for a healthy diet, has uncertainty about the ability to obtain food, and probably has skipped meals or run out of food occasionally, whereas a person or household symbolized under the red area has run out of food and gone an entire day without eating at times during the year. In 2021, the FAO reported that moderate or severe food in insecurity has been climbing slowly since 2015 and as of 2021 affects more than 30% of the world population with over 900 million people experiencing severe food insecurity. The concentration and distribution of food insecurity by severity differ significantly across the world's regions, Asia, Africa, Northern America, and Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, with food insecurity being the most prevalent in Asia and Africa, respectively. And the FAO notes that globally and in every region, the prevalence of food insecurity is higher among women than men. In fact, the United States Census Bureau estimates that of its approximate 300 million population, 50% <clears throat> are female and 31.9% are people of color experiencing high levels of food insecurity. In terms of race and ethnicity, the United States Department of Ag Agriculture's Economic Research Service reports that between 2001 and 2021, Black and Hispanic households have experienced substantially more food insecurity in the past decade than other racial and ethnic households. Peniman blames this disparity on age-old racism, noting racism is built into the DNA of the U.S. food system, beginning with the genocidal land theft from indigenous people continuing with the kidnapping of our ancestors from the shores of West Africa for forced agricultural labor, morphing into convict leasing, expanding to the migrant guest worker <clears throat> program and maturing into its current state where farm management is among the whitest professions, but farm labor is predominantly brown and exploited. People of color disproportionately live in food apartheid neighborhoods and suffer from diet-related illnesses related to malnutrition. This diagram shows the pathways one can take when there is uncertain access to food at the household or individual level to different forms of life-threatening malnutrition. 
and the World Health Organ Organization defines malnutrition as deficiencies, excesses, or imbalances in a person's intake of energy and nutrients. The term malnutrition addresses three broad groups of conditions. One, undernutrition, which includes wasting, low weight for height, stunting, low height for age, and underweight, low weight for age. Two, micronutrient-related malnutrition, which includes micronutrient deficiencies, a lack of important vitamins and minerals, or micronutrient excess. And three, overweight, obesity, and diet-related non-communicable diseases, such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and some cancers. Here, the FAO comprehensively illustrates food security as a system of activities composed of drivers affecting complex activities ranging from local to global, individual to institution. The complex activities occurring in the food system include subsystems of activities related to the production of food, to its supply within environments where access to healthy food is influenced by numerous top-down and bottom-up drivers. This food system diagram of the FAOs illustrates how the drivers behind recent food security and nutrition trends specifically create multiple impacts throughout the food system, including food environments, leading to impacts on four dimensions of food security, availability, access, utilization, and stability as well as the two additional dimensions of agency and sustainability. These drivers have impacts on attributes of diet, quantity, quality, diversity, safety, and adequacy, and nutrition of health outcomes. To mitigate the negative drivers in the food system towards food security for all, the FAO outlines the following six, po six possible pathways to intervene and transform the global system, food system towards security. First, there's integrating humanitarian development and peace building policies in conflict affected areas. Second, scaling up climate resilience across food systems, strengthening the resilience of the most vulnerable to economic adversity, intervening along the food supply chain to lower the cost of nutritional foods, tackling poverty and structural inequalities, ensuring interventions are pro-poor and inclusive, and strengthening food environments and changing consumer behavior to promote dietary patterns positively um, impact human health and the environment. While the intent of providing these pathways may be for top-down intervention, we interpret them as potential interventional pathways for top-down and bottom-up activities within the realm of design for social innovation and appropriation. A secure food future depends on the continued development of innovative interventions that can disrupt drivers of food insecurity and redirect the system towards greater security that is equitable, just, and sustainable. Designers of all kinds working with other professional and community stakeholders in the food system can play a vital role in creating such a future. The food system is complex though. Where do we even begin to implement the FAO suggestion? We cannot adequately address food insecurity until we understand it and to understand the forces that influence the food system and perpetuate food insecurity, Jacoby et al. argue that knowledge of the actors and activities in the system is necessary. On the left, one can see the extractive flow of value that occurs between producers and consumers in large scale. Industrial food systems where a grand producer pr provides mostly processed food to a consumer at cost. The consumer has limited agency in the control of their food choices or what they eat, and that agency may be 
further compromised based on various factors, including affordability and geographic location, affecting their access to healthier, fresh, and unprocessed options. Attaining food security depends on citizens becoming empowered to contribute to the production of the food they consume. In addition to large-scale industrial agricultural production, a food system thrives when there are also home gardens, community gardens, urban farms, and training. Strip a system of that redundancy and you increase its efficiency, but you also reduce its adaptability and resilience. A sustainable food system includes production actors, inclusive of mainstream food businesses, small alternative food businesses, and citizen activists coordinated through strategic plans and policies. A sustainable food system designed to address inequity and injustice engages consumers and producers, the actors in all phases of the food system as shown on the right. Understanding these different or these independent actors producers, consumers, and consumer producers, and the interdependency of their activities in the sustainable food system is essential to mediating and supporting their interactions towards a more sustainable food secure future. Grubinger et al. define a food system as an interconnected web of activities, resources, and people that extend across domains involved in providing nutrition that sustains health including production, processing, packaging, distribution, marketing, conception, and disposal of food. Whereas in their study of food systems in Kenya and Bolivia, Jacoby et al. sought to make visible the actors that participated in four phases of food that they delineated as agricultural inputs and production, processing and storage, distribution and trade and consumption and recycling. Their stages of food supply from creation to recycling updates the linear process commonly thought of in global society's top-down large-scale industrial system that is creating food that travels long distances from a remote farm to the household plate and finally to the landfill. Instead, their stages of food imply a more circular process with a recycling process that redirects food waste to the generation of new food. Using both Jacoby et al. and Grubinger et al.'s definitions of food system, we operationalize a food system as a set of scaled and interdependent sustainable activities that occur across the following spectrum. Agri, culture and aquaculture, production, processing, distribution, communication, accessibility, consumption, and waste. While Grubinger's use of the term production may be inclusive of agriculture, we aim to bring clarity to the food system by separately, by separating early stages of food production into the two phases, agriculture or aquaculture and production. We also added accessibility to include activities related to equity and justice and communication and to further clarify the important role graphics, communication and visual communication design plays or can play in the food system. In our representation of the food system illustrated here, there are eight, there are eight phases. And the activities of um, food systems reflect and respond to social, cultural, political, economic, health, and environmental conditions that are not necessarily depicted here, but are involved in, in the system from, um, and can be identified at multiple scales from an individual's plate to a household kitchen, to a community restaurant, to a regional food bank, to a nation. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Audrey. Uh, I would like to continue by sharing the design outcome categories. And so Heskett notes that design uh, should be the crucial anvil 
on which the human environment in all its detail is shaped and constructed for the betterment and delight of all. And so we utilized Heskett's design categories, including objects, which are single multi intersensory three-dimensional objects encountered in spaces that function in some capacity that is intuitive or learned. And so you might think of examples of this like a salt shaker or a farming tool. Communications, uh, this might be what you often think about when you think about design. Two-dimensional imagery accompanied by text that can evoke an array of emotions and actions and influence cognition and behavior. And so things like this might include package design, logos, apps, environments. There are frameworks that facilitate activities and patterns of use, behavior, and expectations within spaces. Identities, and so that is the strategic combination of the objects, communications, and environments that expresses meaning intended to shape, even you know, possibly preempt what others perceive or understand. Systems, so interacting, interrelated, interdependent elements that form a collective and functioning entity. And context, right? The professional organization and management of the knowledge set, scope, conduct, and playing field of a specialized activity, including but not limited to a program, a professional organization, or governing policy. Recent scholarship has actually extended Heskett's categories to include the following actions as design forms as well. And so we also looked at futures, a series of speculative and imaginary activities directed towards a desired outcome. So this might be something like a campaign or a movement. Uh, service design, which is a mindset, process, tool set, cross-disciplinary language or management approach that improves a service or creates a new one. And then interaction design, that shaping of use-oriented qualities of digital artifacts for a satisfactory or improved experience or performance. And then experience design, the strategic orchestration of an engagement with something that is functional, engaging, or purposeful. In addition, we established what we call the eight E's of sustainability and the criteria for selecting the do's, uh, the design outcomes to populate the wicked solution to food insecurity. And these include ethical, right? They do no harm to humans or communities or the earth. They're equitable and just, they facilitate greater inclusivity. Uh, environmental, so it improves the environment without harming it. And economical, it permits value to return to all actors in the system, thereby yielding what English refers to as generative justice. Ecological, it contributes to the healthy balance of the social ecosystem. Enduring, it's durable and lasts a long time. It's effectuated, it has been implemented within a public context, and it's effective. Evidence shows that it works. Uh, the selected DOs uh, met some, but not necessarily all, of the eight E's of sustainability criteria. Uh, and I also want to note that the dues in all quadrants come from peer-reviewed sources published after 2009, the founding of the International Food Design Society. For each article that we reviewed, we asked the following question to assess fit. Is there a do that fits one of the design categories that we just went through? Is the do effectuated and discussed as effective? Does the do align with one or more of those eight E's of sustainability? And does the do address a part of the food system? And so as Audrey mentioned, the result was 73 top-down, bottom-up, sustainable food dues divided into the four quadrants. And in identifying the leverage points, you can begin to see where those gaps might exist that are areas that could be further explored with the recognition that the leverage points are fluid. And so with that, I would like to share an example of a do from each of the quadrants. So quadrant A's do's impact different parts of the world as evidenced in this slide. Uh, the shading indicates the, the density of sustainable food do's that we examined for that geographic region with the darker areas, meaning that there were more do's in that space. There were 30 identified dues in this section, and that was the most of any of the quadrants uh, that address food security, equity, and justice issues in wide ranging ways. So from the facilitation of household agriculture to collaborative design methods for growing food, like participatory design or design thinking. And it includes funded, resourced, or otherwise supported by public and private institutions for a limited geographic region. And I just want to make a note that top down in such cases is not necessarily anti-democratic. In some cases, it's simply designating federal funding or corporate backing. And once funded, the control may be largely local, 
indeed, it's that localized quality of these cases that creates such such variations, right? These dues emerge from a relationship between the local community and actors with economic and political resources. So, you know, in its best form, this is a research practitioner partnership such that local voices can enter at every level from conceptualization to assessment. So here's an example of a do from quadrant A, the Brazilian Mandala system from Nobra and Biscaya 2015, a family farming system in Brazil that represents the food category of agriculture and design category of system. And so for this do, students from a range of different academic disciplines collaborated with an entrepreneur, uh, Willy Pessoa Rodriguez, on the development of the Mandala Agency, which is an NGO in Brazil, with the aim to eradicate hunger and poverty in that location in a sustainable way. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to educate members of low income families on how their fields could be used to cultivate food that could then provide both nourishment and income. And so then in turn, the students through the NGO collaborated with the low income families in rural areas in Brazil to innovate solutions to hunger and poverty. And so their collaborative process was informed by the design thinking process. And their solution, uh, as you can see, was inspired by the solar system. As the sun lies in the center of the solar, solar system with planets revolving around it, they conceived of a similarly structured family farming system called the Brazilian Mandala system. And so in the center is a water reservoir and around it are nine concentric circles. And the first three circles provide food security for the family. And then the next five are for generating family income. And then the ninth circle can be used to sustain the environment by cultivating native crops. In quadrant B, we have 16 dues that originate in or propagate in various locations around the world and show dues funded or supported by public and private institutions for a wider geographic region that may include adoption or appropriation by multiple countries, states, regions, cities, communities, or households. And uh, when we look at the stakeholders for this quadrant, they include educational institutions, nonprofit organizations, community supported agriculture farms, grassroots agricultural associations, your food hubs, your food co-ops, NGOs, among other types of entities. And they emerge primarily from actors or stakeholders with access to economic or political resources. So some may have a place of origin before widespread production, adoption, or appropriation, and whereas others seemingly kind of self-replicate in multiple places. And so one example from quadrant B is edible insects, right? Like an alternative protein farming found in various locations across the world. Edible insects are a valuable source of sustainable protein for humans and for animals and have gained increased attention as a way to address global food insecurity. And you know the reality is, is that while many people across the globe already include insects as part of their diets, Eating insects is still considered very much a novelty to many Westerners. Edible insects though require less feed, less water and less space and emit fewer GHG than other animal-based protein sources. Uh, it's important also though to understand that regulations exist and vary for the distribution of insects, particularly for consumption. The one thing I wanna note here is that it is you know, really important to understand how design can serve as an important strategy to increase consumer acceptance of something like edible insects in the West. Uh, and so an example of the do is Copy et al. 2019 and the Circa Perky Cricket Jar in the food category of consumption and the design category of object, uh, which was a glass jar with layers of different cr cricket-based granola ingredients that were visible through the glass. And Originally, it was sold in Finland in 2016, and it was promoted as a kitchen decoration since it was illegal to sell edible insects at the time. However, the company encouraged customers to share social media posts preparing and eating the cricket granola. And this continued advocacy for legalization of edible insects was promoted in 2018 in Sweden, where whole roasted crickets were also put in a translucent jar uh, and were introduced by Gritty. And so both entopreneurs, new insect food companies, sought to influence regulation policy by consumer demand. And eventually the local food authority in Finland amended regulations and accepted insects as food.
Quadrant Cs, 14 DOs, uh, dues impact different parts of the world as shown here in the shaded areas and shows peer-reviewed design outcomes created by citizens for a local context that propagates in multiple places, including countries, states, regions, cities, or communities. And the citizen stakeholders for this quadrant include artists, innovators, local communities, and food activists. The dues emerge from grassroots stakeholders who may initiate sustainable food design projects using their resources or collaborating, pooling, and soliciting resources. Some have a local place of origin before widespread propagation through commercial or com cultural production. So, you know, the reality of, again, the situation is, is that designers have long been engaged with the visual elements of the food industry through packaging and marketing. However, you know, the design discipline continues to grapple with the ethics of their professional practice. Do we continue to focus solely on putting food on the table, so to speak, uh, by designing whatever the client requests, despite its impact on the world? Or do we allow ethics to inform our creative choices? Uh, we've all seen in the grocery store and the supermarket, the small typeset text on food packages uh, communicating where our food has come from that we're about to consume. And according to the 2013 New Yorker article titled, What Does Made in Label Mean Anymore? The need to know where food comes from originated in 1887 when the British, intent on stigmatizing imitation goods from Germany, passed a law forcing foreign com companies to make the origins of their products clear on the packaging. And so here, what you're looking at is designers and Blumenstein, uh, designers Blumenstein and Seelemann integrate the food origin phenomenon through a banana passport that, passport that they designed that documents one banana's travel from Ecuador to Iceland through the food category of communications and the design category of object. And they found that the average ban banana travels 8,800 kilometers on its 14 day journey to Iceland and is touched by 33 people per day. So Flood and Sloan describe it as functioning poetically, leveraging the power of art and design to make that hidden visible and to hold this particular aspect of the food system accountable. Quadrant D's 13 dues uh, impact different parts of the world and includes design outcomes created by citizens for a limited geographic region that may be a single country, state, region, city, local community, or household. And its citizen stakeholders include artists, innovators, food activists, and even local communities working with other professional stakeholders. Uh, the dues emerge bottom up and localized from individual and pooled grassroots resources and collaborations. In uh, their 2021 Food Waste Index Report, the UN Environmental Program estimates that around 931 million tons of food waste was generated in 2019, of which 61% came from households. In India, household food waste is estimated to be about 68.7 million tons annually. And so it's important to remember that reducing ho household food waste helps to mitigate change, climate change worldwide, uh, while also moving us towards greater food security. Uh, in India, aesthetically pleasing handcrafted terracotta composting pots sold under the brand Daily Dump are used to improve households daily waste management. And uh, Daily Dump from Flood and Sloan 2019 is in the cate food category of waste and the design category of object and address the challenge and the stigma of household food waste in India and are used pervasively in households there. Uh, Daily Dump challenges that stigma of handling waste by changing our perceptions of it from something that's maybe gross or considered shameful to something designed that can generate visual beauty in the household. In conclusion, uh, we acknowledge that the layered complexity of the food system, the ubiquitous nature of design, and the wide scope of sustainability inherently create limitations in this work. Within each community across the world, uh, I know in my own community, there are so many innovative design solutions to address food insecurity, equity, and justice that are not published in peer-reviewed journals for a host of reasons. The selected dues we used in our book were limited to peer-reviewed articles to share a selection of what currently exists in a scholarly realm and to provide an example for all who seek to future publish peer-reviewed research on the subject and to bring more designers, diverse voices into this scholarly space, into these conversations where important decisions are being made that impact our, our future and our society and our environment. 
the field of, of sustainable food design is still very emergent and our collection of sustainable food dues recognizes that design is a very broad term. Uh, it was applied to peer-reviewed articles and research conducted with a transdisciplinary lens, identifying dues outside of what might be considered traditional design fields uh, conducted by researchers not necessarily considered designers or not self-identifying as such. And the dues were primarily derived from qualitative research and were only considered from articles in English, limiting that broad cross-cultural critical mapping. While some of the dues exist globally in different contexts and have universal qualities that can be appropriated by communities across the world, not all are relevant or applicable to all spaces. You know, sustainable design innovation begins by ident identifying what assets already exist and work within a specific community or space. Who's already doing what work in that community affected and how can we as designers work together across cultures to spark energy of collective creativity and address these issues. The goal is to move designers and others beyond solution focused superficial dues that become unsustainable without the investment and engagement of the community affected. Finally, our future work on the Wicked Solution to Food Insecurity entails the development of a web-based interactive visualization system called Wisdom.io, which has already been uh, started by Audrey and her students, that facilitates cross-disciplinary and laid design experts plotting their own assets or seeking design solutions to a local context. The goal is for the platform to enable all stakeholders to locate and share sustainable food design assets broadly with each other, which can help inform policymakers and others in the future by seeing the ebb and flow of the wicked solution to food insecurity through sustainable food design in process and over time. And with that, I wanted to just extend uh, our gratitude uh, on behalf of Audrey and I, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for presenting. What a powerhouse of a talk from both of you. We've got a flood of questions appearing in the Q&A. It's quite intimidating, the number that have already come through. But please, and this is, I guess, something I'm meant to shoot myself in the foot by saying, please put more questions in if you have questions, even if they're coming to you while we're answering other questions. But one to start off with. So we are at the Centre for Food Policy at City University of London. Can I start off with asking, what are the takeaways that a policymaker needs to think about with regards to design thinking, with regards to your framing and the gaps that you found within the different quadrants. I mean, I'll be asking probably about the quadrants and things a little bit later on, but I guess the thing is there are policymakers on the call. There are activists on the call. How can they best start taking the, your findings and start applying them in the real world or engaging with design thinking? What are the first steps they have to do? Two big things to start with. Jennifer, would you like to start? Yeah, I, I, I can go ahead and start and then feel free to uh, to chime in. And I think, you know, what we found through the, um, you know, the review of, of all of these dues that we found and even the ones that, that didn't make it into the book uh, was that need to, to really... Um, that, that transdisciplinary lens becomes so critical. Uh, and that, you know, the idea of also bringing design into the equation. Uh, and so how can we in, in spaces and places, one, make sure that we're activating the community in these conversations and how might we bring designers to the table to help um, activate those conversations and to to really, you know, as, as we talked about, the, the key is really finding solutions that are gonna be sustainable, right? Like sustainable solutions that are also sustainable, <clears throat> right? That, that you are really working with the community in um, participatory design methods and other ways that the, the people who are truly affected and impacted by these issues have a voice at the table. Uh, and so how do you create spaces like that? How do you involve um, communities in that way uh, that empowers them to take ownership of the solutions? Uh, and so what designers can bring to the table <clears throat> is creative ways and, and innovative ways to think about that um, to help, you know, uh, lead towards policy uh, as it as it speaks to uh, creating those effective solutions. Uh, and I think, you know, some of the examples that we saw here in, in the different quadrants, um, you know, the, the, the way that the insect, uh, you know, the edible insects, right, the, the idea was is they weren't legal. Right, uh, but that there was this kind of crowd-based um, support for it that then uh, got more momentum 
and was able to push that forward. So um, I think it, it's also a matter of thinking about uh, things that, that uh, we're trying to address here in creative ways. I, I think that's a wonderful response, Jennifer. Um, I don't have too much to add, but I, I think that there are currently silos between disciplines that prevent um, collaboration, transdisciplinary kinds of um, collaboration, and we need to break those silos down and collaborate, learn to collaborate. Um, as I mentioned before, we're graphic designers. Um, <laughs> And when we started our critical mapping process, we didn't know what we were going to find. Um, and we were very, very surprised to see design emerge um, in a diverse way, you know, with the different dues. And so I think that, you know, through collaboration, we can begin to fill those gaps in the wicked solution and really um, make, take a bigger bite out of um, the wicked problem of food insecurity. Thank you. And I, I think it's great remembering that positionality that you both come from in terms of the design perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask a question from Hans van der Eckhout, which has just come through because it's on this, um, how should we be using these design perspectives? And then I'll move on to, uh, I guess, some more um, practical questions around your, your findings, if that's OK. So Hans has just asked this, but he was asking, um, could you give a little bit more, a few more recommendations for practitioners in food systems transformation and how can they use this for entrepreneurship how can they use design methods for entrepreneurship so if they're using business models or how can they engage their business models with uh, systems mapping um, he loves the idea of putting the problem at the front and solution uh, the, putting the problem first as it were but again is there anything else you want to highlight so you, we've talked about policy makers but anybody else operating in the food system how to engage with design thinking before we move on to some of the other questions a anything else you want to highlight there in terms of any other org groups working there um one thing i'd like to clarify is that our approach is critical mapping it's not necessarily design thinking um and it, it's really about integrating sustainability um, and a, you know, an extended definition of sustainability in the design of future innovations to address food insecurity. So we are not advocating for design thinking, we're advocating for critical mapping, which is a process that certainly involved um, design thinking and policy and a lot of different disciplines. And what we're advocating for is a collaboration across disciplines, right? And our next step in the critical mapping process is really going out into the community and finding assets, you know, that are not a part of um, peer review scholarship, right? That are addressing the food insecurity problem in local communities. And the way to do that is through primary research that is funded. Right. So um, I hope that addresses the question. But, you know, I just wanted to clarify that um, we're design researchers. We're not um, design thinkers. My apologies there. I should have used the term critical mapping. You're, you're totally yeah. right there. Yeah. Um, uh, Jennifer, anything else? Or I can, I can move on to the critical mapping specific <laughs> questions, as it were. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to interject. And and also, right, that in some of the dues that we discovered there, they were using design thinking as the method of design uh, mm -hmm. that was, you know, uh, that they were using for, you know, the different dues. And so, uh, you know, certainly it was something that is is used as something that can be used as innovation in this food design space. Uh, but right, that we're we're really looking at that broader scope of an understanding of design and the different ways that can be applied uh, to the food system. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, now, just to highlight in terms of critical mapping, because I feel a lot of us didn't see the grid for long enough to appreciate it, um, but yeah. we're also a very broad church within the audience here of, of 90 plus people. Um, could I just 
ask then from your disciplinary background what does mimetic mean this was asked by two different people could you just clarify what each of the different axes or extremes can mean on on the grid if you want to share the screen again um sure. so this, this was asked by different people and would you be able to just again share the different <clears throat> quadrants a b c d just because we appreciated the different uh, sections, but it's just highlighting that that the differences of the extremes would be, I think, very helpful to us. So, Jennifer, I I don't I don't know if you're still sharing your screen. Yeah, I, I can. I'm not. But we I can. could either go to slide 18, okay. or we can go back to um, the beginning. Okay. I believe slide four. tell me when here yeah so here we are so mimetic means simply widespread um this is a theoretical kind of model for critical mapping um when we actually put it into action you could say we um move from mimetic to the word widespread um to clarify exactly what we meant by that so if you go to slide 18 Jennifer, where we show the wicked solution. And so here you can see um, this is the wicked solution to food insecurity that shows um, the different types or the quantity of dues from each quadrant, right? Quadrant A, you start reading it um, from the top right, quadrant A. Um, includes local sustainable food design funded or supported by public or private institutions. You move to the left and you find widespread sustainable food design funded or supported by large scale public or private institutions. Directly below that, we have more bottom up dues that we found in quadrant C we show the widespread sustainable food design created by citizens. And in quadrant D to the right of that, you have local sustainable food design created by citizens. And in Jennifer's presentation, she really went through and explained exactly what we meant by that, right? Policy um, designers would probably be in the top down portion, right? It could be educators, the government, et cetera, we're creating designs that impact um, either local communities and local geographic areas, or it could be um, policy and innovation design that's impacting, um, you know, multiple countries, multiple communities, et cetera. Okay, and bottom up just simply means that it's coming from citizens um, who are maybe using their own resources or maybe have resources, but they're the drivers of this innovation. And it's it's really fascinating being able to dwell on this slide a little, a little bit longer now mm -hmm. and just yeah. seeing, uh, as you've highlighted, the leverage points or I guess where public or private institutions may not be necessarily developing solutions and where the citizenry themselves may not be developing Absolutely. solutions just because there may not be that many citizens involved with those parts of the food right. system or multiple other right. reasons. And so this slide really is intended to help policy designers or developers to think about where, you know, there are gaps in the wicked solution to food security could, that could use new policy. You could go to the wicked solution to food insecurity to find existing policy that you know, is effective, right? It's peer reviewed, it's effective, it works. Um, you could come here and say, okay, well, I have, or I know of something that is not included here because it's not a part of peer reviewed um, scholarship and I would like it included and you can use the website to um, provide that information. And that's where we're trying to go with a fluid kind of wicked solution visualization that allows um, anyone to come to it and and contribute, you know, dues that are not yet reflected in the wicked solution here. And 
when we're able to balance, you know, the system, it's only then that we believe that food insecurity will be addressed. Jennifer, anything more to add on that? Yeah, I, I think that that was very well said, and and that's exactly right. Um, you know, we recognize this is just the the beginning uh, of a process that that you know uh, we we hope to continue to carry forward, um, both you know in in continuing to look for for dues, but also in in the system that that Audrey has started with her students. Brilliant, and it sounds like there's a, an amazing interactive tool that hopefully we can share, or and also probably put on the YouTube video once it's available and goes live. We can put a link on our description and things like that. Um, so hopefully, if you're watching a recording, there's something down below on the video description for you to see. Um, just while we're on this uh, slide, there was a question around uh, non-human animals within your frameworks. And so uh, it was uh, to, just to sorry, this wasn't this slide. It was two slides previously on on your sustain on your definitions of sustainability and actors. Um, and so it was just highlighting in terms of uh, uh, you quote Holt Gimenez. I think there we are Holt, um, around yeah. Yeah, around the, the the human need for the environment and the eight E's of sustainability and linking them back to that slide. And just one of the questions is asking, um, did you look at any solutions for non-human animals? Uh, so uh, animals, as it were, non-humans within your within these solutions at all. Um, so it's not harming humans, communities, or Earth. Um, but uh, did you look at animal-related issues within that, this? That's a wonderful question. Um, again, in, I would say yes, we found that, definitely. We found examples of that that are not included in the Wicked Solution because of this criteria that we use to select them. Right. So are they there? Yes, but they may not really address um, the food problem in a way that's eth ethical, equitable and just environmental, you know, economical, ecological, enduring, effective and um, effectuated. Right. Um, that was very important. And, you know, were they examples of design? That's really debatable as well. OK, so it was a very rigorous and thoughtful kind mm. of process of identifying these dues and then saying, OK, you know, and Jennifer and I met many times to discuss them and to really go over our criteria and to define, to carefully operationalize um, our design categories to make sure, you know, that this actually is a do and this is this one is just not. Mm -hmm. um, there were wonderful ideas, like theories for how you might go about addressing food insecurity, but they were not, they were not effectuated. Not right? operational. So they had not, exactly, exactly. So they were not included. And yeah, I'm and sure I, there are, sorry, you could. No, no, no. Yeah. So, and, and I would also add, right, we found many articles uh, that, you know, really spoke to food design uh, as it is coming into the forefront. And and yet they weren't speaking to sustainability, right? And so again, that's that right. was part of the yeah, process. That's right. And so it is that Very interconnected, as you've highlighted, the, the, the non-siloed thinking of bringing these different perspectives of sustainability, food and security together to solve, mm -hmm. in this case, this wicked problem. Highlighting the 80s of sustainability, just for clarity, you've developed this this structure here. This is this is novel and new as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. Because it, it's, it's a really interesting framing of the different uh, parts of sustainability. But I won't hold. I'm I'm not here to just be really excited for things. Um, people have got to ask questions about it. Hint, hint. In the Q and A, hint, hint. If you want to know more about that, I have to ask different questions here. Um, so, uh, one of the people was asking just on your um, results slide that it was just your data there. That's just to, just to confirm that was your representation of data. It doesn't necessarily represent reality, correct? So it, it's not necessarily all the solutions out there. These gaps are because it's coming from the right. Peer literature. Right, and that, that's a part of our limitations um, slide where we say, okay, this is not representing everything that is out there. We have carefully 
to find what we believe a do is within this wicked solution. The wicked solution is comprised of do's that we believe are effectively addressing food insecurity, right? We've developed this criteria um, for selecting them. So yes, you're going to find other examples out there, just like Jennifer said, some of them are not sustainable, but they do address food insecurity, right? It's a complex kind of um, system. And we want to clearly try to clearly visualize what is working in the system. How can we contribute um, new innovations to the system to address food insecurity? All right. So this is about our trying to see what is working and to show that to other researchers so that to help them as they when they sit down, you know, at that table to decide, OK, what are we going to do next? Right. Future generations coming to, you know, the food insecurity problem will find this useful in terms of what has worked right and how to replicate that moving forward um or to or replicate existing solutions that are working well moving forward or um innovate new ones that can mm -hmm. take that system to you know balance and um finally annihilate um food insecurity Anything more to add, Jennifer? Or just trying to get, uh, give you both chances to speak. Yeah, no, all... I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking too, you know, the other thing that, that, you know, with the intent behind this book was really that understanding in, in the design process, you know, it moves through a, a period of research and discovery. And then there's a, a point where you're really seeking to, you know, what problem are we trying to solve in that problem definition? And so this book and this, 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 integrative literature review that we we did was you know part of that intent was really to figure out where in this space right like that you can intervene and you know defining that space by uh, some of these parameters that, that we put in place uh, to help guide people to understand how they might do that and or contribute to for future scholarship on it <clears throat> no, thank you. And that's a, a really good point in terms of just going, these are the leverage points you found. And uh, it, basically, I'm really excited for your work because I'm going to be use, hopefully using it next semester with my students in looking at putting your framework onto value chains, as it were. So instead of system level, but saying specific commodity change, could you do a similar approach? But anyway, that's not for now. Let's talk about questions before I get distracted. Um, so one of the questions we have because we were talking about sustainability before we go back to the ease because somebody said about this but you were both talking about uh, the different trade-offs of what works and what and um michelle washington has asked what impact has environmental issues um with every uh, with the ever-changing climate on food systems and I, I guess what she's trying to ask here is about, well, I'm interpreting it as asking, Michelle, please write back if I've misinterpreted, uh, but just highlighting was climate change within any of your sustainability, within any of your solutions as an impact, or was the changing climate part of this as well? So resilience to climate change within your solutions database versus also just climate change as part of the wider solution, uh, wider sustainability solution, if you see the difference there, or where either of those two framing coming up. Oh, that's how I'm interpreting what she's asking. Michelle, so, thank you so much for the question and thank you for attending today's talk. Um, Jennifer, I think you may have more to say about this with your um, slant towards sustainability. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think that um, you know, many of the do's that we looked at were looking at things like climate change. Uh, I, I don't know that we were specifically calling that out other than in the eight E's uh, in terms of the um, the way that we looked at environmental, the environmental component uh, and the ecological components of, of uh, mm -hmm. sustainability. Uh, but yes, there were, there were definitely references and uh, impacts to climate change in, in several of the DOs that that we looked at. Lovely. Uh, thank you for that. I guess if we're going back to the DOs and and the, and the ease, as it were, in terms of the the different ease of sustainability, um, 
so uh, an anonymous attendee, so they didn't give a name, um, are asking about were they a binary option for each of them or was it a scale across that? So how do you balance how many E's around that? Uh, how many E's that it takes to select a, a do or is it just if it ticks one box um, is what I'm reading into it. But what, but when you were going through and saying this matches, was it a yes, no tick box or was it a binary shade of gray, sorry, a shade of gray type um, scale? I shouldn't say that. Yeah, I, that's, I that's another wonderful, wonderful question because it was very interesting as we took our do that was found during the peer review literature, you know, literature review. And then we said, okay, this one, I think, and, you know, Jennifer can chime in um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I know that we were very, very careful to say, okay, it really needs to be environmental, right? It, it can't be a do that does not, um, is not sustainable in terms of the traditional kind of typical um, definition that we understand sustainable to mean right, in terms of the environment. So if it's not addressing, if it's harming the environment or it's not even um, saying that it cares about the environment, then it can't be included. Not all dues um, fit every single criteria, but some were required. So you had environmental, the environmental criterion required. It had to have been affected so it can't just be a concept or a theoretical idea um, that is not tested, right? Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Jennifer. I may be forgetting yeah. something. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and I would say that, I mean, we read quite a few, um, you know, very theoretical um, papers that would have, that were very, very interesting. But again, uh, they were not effectuated, right? They hadn't yeah, been- Exactly. Testing. And so uh, those those were were- not used, so. Well, th thank you for that, and thank you for that clarification. Um, I guess the last few questions here, there's there's a shout out to an organization doing food systems work and I'll share from Samira Salbi, and I'll uh, send that those links onto the authors afterwards so they can collect those um, evidences. Catherine thank is you. also, uh, Catherine is also, Catherine Guy, I should say, is also asking, will the slides be available? The entire recording will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so uh, th there's a link to that in the chat, but Elaine might want to put the link to the YouTube channel again. Hopefully within the next 48 hours or so, we'll have this as a recording up so you can see through those slides um, as part of a recording of this and the Q&A. Um, and then the last three or four questions are all, I guess, around action so one was asking more around um how are uh, people such as the daily dump were they using this critical math mapping method um or are entrepreneurs now using the critical ma mapping method um and uh, uh that i think elaine has been well, ticking for different questions off as we're going through it seems so it seems that the, the last few are around opera operationalization of it so are there any other hints you would like to give mm. around taking this forward either as educators as students or as people wanting to use this out in the real world of the food system yeah that's a great question and it's complex it's like we definitely want um, design scholars like ourselves, right, using the critical mapping method to address other wicked problems in society, right? And we also want people who are out there, the design thinkers and the, you know, the, the doers, as I think someone mentioned, Hans mentioned, we want you immersed in our wicked solution, contributing to it, you know, and helping us to address um, food insecurity. So critical mapping is a process that, you know, I would like to continue using on different wicked problems in society beyond food insecurity, right? How can we use it to address war? Um, you know, there are tons of other wicked problems in the world and how can critical mapping be used to um, address them. But we want all food thinkers and designers and innovators and policymakers to engage with us 
in the Wicked Solution. Thank you, Audrey. And any anything else from you, Jennifer, on the, the final ideas around operate oper operationalization or things we should be taking away from this? Yeah, and and I think you know, as as we noted, you know, there we recognize that there are many innovative design, food design, sustainable food design solutions in communities across the world. And you know, what tends to happen is is that again, you know, those silos occur, and and not that they are replicable or applicable to other spaces, but maybe there's a seed of something that can be used if we just mm -hmm. knew about them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, mm -hmm. part of it is how do we connect in a way that allows us to share this information, uh, to, to build a more sustainable world. And in addition, how can we continue to um, encourage others when they you know, have a solution that has been effectuated and is working, uh, that it, it finds its way into a scholarly resource that, uh, that we're then able to, to look at there as well. That's a, a really good point in terms of just seeing what's there and, and appreciating that more things will hopefully emerge into scholarly literature as well and appreciating hopefully that there are wider boundary, well, wider solutions out there that we still do not know. Yeah. Um, can I just, from everybody on the call, thank you so much for presenting tonight. It has been brilliant to hear you speak and present your critical mapping approach. Um, I think everybody is kind of putting claps in the chat or jazz hands if you're at home. Um, please do thank our two panelists tonight, for Food Thinkers. Again, if you're interested, next month is on November the 15th with Professor Sarah Bridal talking about food and climate change. Thank you all very much for attending. Uh, this recording will be online shortly. Uh, again, let's just all thank Jennifer and Audrey and good night from all of us here at the Centre for Food Policy. Bye.